well, good morning, folks. Uh, Jason here from God Conversations here in Medicine Hat. Um, I want to talk to you a little bit about uh, God's blessings and curses out of uh, Deuteronomy 28 and 29. Now, I, I got to let you know that these blessings and curses are for the nation of Israel. However, as we go into the New Testament, we will see that a lot of this does apply to those who are not part of the nation of Israel. And um, my wife is American. My kids are dual citizens. And I lived in the States in Texas for five years. And there's two slogans that the Americans use, especially Texans. I love Texans. And that, that is number one, God bless America. And number two is in God we trust. And you see that all over the money. Now, that being said, we need to think about, are, are we living our lives? Uh, there's my son Sawyer back there. Say hi, Sawyer. Hi. Okay, he's going to be looking for the garbage truck. Anyway, um, are we living our lives for God's blessing? Or are we living our lives knowing that we are under the wrath of God? That's the question. Now, Deuteronomy 28 is broken up into two phases. The first phase is the blessing. And that is 40, uh, sorry, that is 14 verses. 14 verses for blessing. The curses, however, for disobedience, there's 53 verses. I'm not going to go over all 53 for you today. I just want to point out a few things. Verse 15 is where the curses start. And it says, and God, and God says, But if you will not obey the, uh, the voice of the Lord your God, or be careful to do all of his commandments and his statutes that I command you today, then all these curses shall come upon you and overtake you. Um, I'm just going to talk about a few of them here. Verse 20. The Lord will send on you curses. Who's going to send these curses? The Lord. The Lord will send on you curses, confusion, and frustration in all that you undertake to do until you are destroyed and perish quickly on account of the evil of your deeds because you have forsaken me. You will perish. I want to cross-reference that to John 3.16. Jesus says, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. Now that word believe means live your life according to. It doesn't mean an intellectual assent. It means live your life according to. That's the first thing I want to talk about. You will perish Second thing is verse 28. <clears throat> the Lord will strike you with madness and blindness and confusion of mind, and you shall grope at noonday as the blind grope in darkness, and you shall not prosper in your ways. That's interesting. Oh, you might hear my cats going. Um, they're playing. <laughs> But uh, 
Why is this verse important? There's only one other place in the law, uh, the Torah, the Pentateuch. That, that's the first five books of the Bible. There's only one other place where something like this is even mentioned. And it's Genesis chapter 19, uh, verse 11. But I'm going to read it to you in context. And this is the beginning of... Uh, the story of Sodom and Gomorrah. It says, The two angels came to Sodom in the evening, and Lot was sitting there in the gate of Sodom. When Lot saw them, he rose to meet them, and bowed himself with his face to the earth, and said, My lords, please turn aside to your servant's house, and spend the night, and wash your feet. Then you may raise, uh, rise up early, and go on your way. They said, no, we will spend the night in the town square. But he pressed them strongly, so they turned aside to him and entered his house. And he made them a feast and baked unleavened bread, and they ate. But before they lay down, the men of the city, the men of Sodom, both young and old, all the people to the last man surrounded the house, and they called to Lot. Where are the men who came to you tonight? Bring them out to us that they may that we may know them. Lot went out to the men at the entrance, shut the door after them, and said, I beg you, my brothers, do not act so wickedly. Behold, I have two daughters who have not known any man. Let me bring them out to you and do to them as you please. Only do nothing to these men, for they have come under the shelter of my roof. But he said, stand back. And they said, this fellow came to sojourn and he has become the judge. Now we will deal worse with you than with them. Then they pressed hard against the man Lot and drew near to break the door down. But the men reached out their hands and brought Lot into the house with them and shut the door. And they struck with blindness the men who were at the entrance of the house, both small and great, so that they wore themselves out, groping for the door. So let's go back and let's read this again. In verse 28 of Deuteronomy 28, The Lord will strike you with madness and blindness and confusion of mind, and you shall grope at noonday as the blind grope in darkness, and you shall not prosper in your ways. This is where the Jewish nation, or the majority of them, would turn to sexual deviance, primarily homosexuality. Now, God lists a lot of things, uh, a lot of sexual sins that are just not homosexuality. Uh, homosexuality, bisexuality, uh, adultery, fornication, incest, things like this, um, uh, bestiality. In the New Testament, the... Um, the word used for sexual immorality is pornea. And that's where we get our word pornography from. And so what is God talking about here? He's saying, look back to Sodom. This is what I'm going to do to you. Really interesting. Let's go down to verse 47. Because you did not serve the Lord your God with joyfulness and gladness of heart because of the abundance of all things, therefore you shall serve your enemies whom the Lord will send against you in hunger and thirst, in nakedness and lacking everything. And he will put a yoke of iron on your neck until he has destroyed you. Who will put a yoke of iron? The Lord. But you cross-reference that with Matthew 11, 28, and 29. And Jesus says, Come to me, all who are burdened and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Interesting. You will have a yoke of iron on you. 
until he, until he has destroyed you. Who will destroy you? The Lord. I want to look at one more thing before we go back into the New Testament. Verse 68 of Deuteronomy 28. And the Lord will bring you back in ships to Egypt, a journey that I promised that you should never make again. And there you shall offer yourselves for sale to your enemies as male and female servants, but there will be no buyer. Now God promised never, never to allow them to go back. But he's saying, I will take you back if your disobedience goes so far. Why is that important? Well, because... The exodus, the crossing of the Red Sea, departing Egypt, going into the promised land, was God's salvation. But he's saying, if you don't want my salvation, I will take you back to the land of sin, to the land of Egypt. Why is that important? Well, We'll look in Romans chapter 1. Verse 18 and following. It says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. For what could be known about God is plain to them, because God has shown it to them. Because uh, for, the, for his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world, in the things that have been made. So they are without excuse, for although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking. And their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to become fool, uh, claiming to, to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man, and birds and animals and creeping things. So, what did the what did these people do? He's not talking about the Israelites anymore. He's talking about the Israelites and the rest of the world. What did we do? And I'm saying we because I was one of those people at one time. We decided not to worship God. We decided to worship something else. And our human nature has a desire to worship something, just not God. In verse 24... Verse 26 and verse 28 say the same thing three times. Now, why is this important? Well, even though Romans was written in Greek, it was written by Paul. And Paul is a Jew. He's a Hebrew. And in Hebrew thought and in Hebrew writing, if you repeat something three times, it means this is very important and almost to the point where he's saying this is set in stone. Listen to this, verse 24. Therefore God gave them up in the lusts of their heart to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves. Almost like God is saying, I'm sending you back to Egypt. You want to go back? I will take you back. I will let you go back to sin. How do you know the wrath of God is on you? God gives you up to your sin and you enjoy it. Verse 25. Because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshipped and served the creature rather than the Creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. Worshipping the creature 
Do you know who we worship the most in our world, especially Canada and the United States? Do you know who we worship the most? Ourselves. The creature. Verse 26. For this reason, God gave them up to dishonorable passions. For their women exchange natural relations for those that are contrary to nature. And the men likewise gave up natural relations with women and were consumed with passion for one another. Men committing shameless acts with men and receiving in, in themselves a due penalty for their error. If you enjoy your sin so much, and God is saying this is sin, homosexuality is sin, bisexuality is sin, sexual sin is sin. God gave you up to that. It's because you enjoy it so much. You're worshiping yourself instead of God. And God gave you up to this, just like he's giving the Israelites back to Egypt. How do you know the wrath of God is on you? God gives you up for you to enjoy your sin. Verse 28. And since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them up to a debased mind to do what ought not be done. They were filled of all manner of righteousness, evil, covetousness, malice. They are full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, maliciousness. They are gossips, slanderers, haters of God, insolent, haughty, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to their parents, foolish, faithless, heartless, ruthless. Though they know God's righteous decree that those who practice such things deserve to die, they not only do them, but give approval to those who practice them. This list is just not picking on homosexuality. You notice gossips, disobedient to the parents, everything that's common to man. How do you know the wrath of God is on you? You enjoy your sin. And you do it snubbing your nose at God. So how do you know, this is how you know the wrath of God is on you. How do you know the blessing of God is on you? You know, as I said earlier, the United States has two slogans. God bless America. And in God we trust. How do you know that the blessing of God is on you? Let's turn to the book of Ephesians chapter 2. I'll get there in just a bit. Here we are. Ephesians 2. And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked. That means your lifestyle. You were dead. You were dead spiritually. And you were dead to God. And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh. Does that sound familiar? God gave us up to our passions? In the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and we're by nature children of wrath, like the rest of mankind. Verse 4. How do you know that the blessing of God is on you? But God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he has loved us, 
even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. What, what is grace? Grace means getting something you don't deserve. By grace you have been saved and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places with Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing, it is the gift of God. This is a gift that God gives us. Not a result of works, you can't earn it, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in, in them. So how do we know the blessing of God is on us? How do we know that God has showed his love towards us? Because we know that God is angry with us and his wrath is on us when we can sin and enjoy it. Verse 10, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Jesus tells us in John 14, 15, he says, If you love me, you will obey my commands. You see, we couldn't love God before. We were under his wrath. And we don't earn God's love. We see it's a gift. So how do we know that, that the blessing of God is on us? How do we know that the love of God is on us? We joyfully, we joyfully obey his word. Let's go back to Deuteronomy 28. And I just want to find it here because I was just thought, uh, I just remember reading it. Verse 47, because you did not serve the Lord your God with joyfulness and gladness of heart because of the abundance of all things. In order to know that the wrath of God is on us, number one, we enjoy our sin. We enjoy it. In order to know the blessing of, of God is on us, we joyfully live out the commands of God. Where are you? Is the wrath of God on you? Or is the love of God on you? We'll talk soon.